Hello, my name is Tony Gutierrez and I work at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, for the next 20 minutes on oil degrading bacteria and their importance in degrading oil in the oceans. So I hope you enjoy this talk. I'm just going to uh, start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully it'll come up. Let's see. Right, here we go. Okay. So I'm going to start off now to begin with showing you how significant the volumes of oil are that enter our oceans and seas each year. Uh, this slide shows the major transportation routes of oil worldwide. You can see by the multitude of shipping routes, uh, as represented by the network of lines going around the world uh, from one country or nation to another, uh, millions of tons of crude oil and its refined products are carried across uh, all the major seas and oceans every year. This results in oil entering the sea from a ship's exhaust fumes and spills that may occur along the way. Now, in this next slide, it shows all the major spills. This is uh, of more than 34 tons um, that have spilled oil into the sea from any source, but which is non-military. Uh, a major take-home message here is that oil spills in the sea occur frequently in one shape or form every year. Now, there can be up to more than 100 spills in a single year around the world, and the volumes of oil that enter the marine environment from these can be from hundreds to thousands of tons to over millions of tons. So you get the idea from human activities, we release a lot of oil accidentally into the sea every single year. Now you'll notice the volume of oil released was huge in 1979, right there as I'm pointing on that graph there. And this um, was from the Ixtoc oil, sorry, the Ixtoc one oil spill, which was a massive disaster that occurred in shallow water at about 50 meters depth only uh, in the Bay of Campeche off the coast of uh, Mexico in the Gulf of Mexico. It resulted in the release of nearly half a million tons of oil. Now the more recent deep water horizon spill, it's not shown on this graph because that occurred in 2010. So this graph is a little out outdated, but that uh, deep water horizon spill it does bear in comparison and both spills today are recognized as the worst oil spill accidents in recorded history. The other one was the Exxon Valdez, but the volume of oil released in that, that spill was way less, but it did um, cause a lot of havoc because it occurred in a very pristine region off the, in, in Alaska. Now, if we were to include on this same graph, the volume of oil released from one military related spillage, in this case, it was the, from the Gulf War. As you'll see from this next slide, there it is there, the Gulf War spill. Um, so this, uh, uh, this spill, basically, if you put it on this graph, it dwarfs all the others in terms of the volume of oil released into the Persian Gulf. And that was not an accidental spill. That was an intentional, deliberate spill. Now, the Gulf, um, uh, fortunately, the frequency of oil spills has decreased over the years, uh, as you can see from this graph. And proportionally, the volume of total oil uh, released into the oceans has also decreased. Um, this is shown by the oil droplets. Um, as you can see, the oil droplets represent the total volume of oil released each year. Sorry, not each year, um, over a period of decades. So the first one in the 70s, the next one in the 80s, and so forth. You can see the volume of oil entering the ocean over the decades has significantly decreased as well. Now, this decrease is attributed mainly to the implementation of stricter regulations with respect to health and safety, the prevention of spills, such as by constructing oil tankers with double hulls. So if they were to run aground, they are less likely to rupture and release their cargo of oil. Now, what I want to show you here with this slide is that in addition to large volumes of oil entering the sea from human activities, it is estimated that as much as 49% of oil entering the seas from natural oil seeps. And this is represented by this huge chunk of the pie, the purple section here. That is the volume of oil um, that represents uh, from natural seeps. 
that it inflows into our seas and oceans every year. When you factor the volumes of oil that enter our oceans from both human activities and natural seeps, so this one, this other half is from human activities, the, the total is enormous. So as you see, hundreds of millions of gallons of oil enter the oceans every year from different sources. Now it is calculated that this would be enough to cover the surface of all the oceans and seas around the world in a thin blanket of oil. When I'm talking about a thin blanket, I'm talking about thickness of a few molecules of oil. But our oceans and seas aren't covered in a black goo. And this is fortunately due mainly to oil degrading bacteria. Now, these bacteria, these are the ocean's gas guzzling machines that help to mop up the oil as it enters the sea. These types of organisms do the same job on land, but they're there's something unique here about the ocean in terms of these bacteria. As far as we know, only the oceans are what contains oil degrading bacteria that use oil as their preferred food. So these types of bacteria are referred to as obligate oil degraders. In other words, if you give them conventional food sources such as sugars, um, they won't touch it, but give them oil and they'll be very content and thrive. Now, since, uh, since the first description of an oil degrading bacteria back in 1913, we've come a very long way to understanding the diversity, function, and ecology of these organisms, especially at oil contaminated sites. Now, in this slide represents a phylogenetic tree. I'm not expecting you to understand what a phylogenetic tree, if you're not familiar with these things, but it shows just the evolutionary relatedness of the various obligate oil degraders that we know of today. And these I show you here on this tree in bold. These are species with names, Alcanoclasticum at the very top. Going down, we have Oleophilus, Oleospira, Thalassolitis, Alcanovorax, Neptunomonas, which apparently is not shown there in bold, but it is an obligate degrader and Cycloclasticus further down. Now, all the other species shown on this tree are also oil degraders, but the difference is that they are not obligate in the, in the sense, in this sense of, of degrading oil, because they are also able to utilize other conventional uh, sources of carbon for their growth and energy, such as sugars, like glucose and fructose and so forth. So there's something quite unique about the ocean that it contains these, these types of bacteria, which just thrive and love and only prefer as a food oil. So where do we find these obligate oil degrading bacteria? Well, with some exceptions, essentially, essentially everywhere. So this map is a, is a bit outdated, but it shows you um, where to find these organisms and they're essentially all over the world. They are what we call ubiquitous. There are some large areas, mainly open ocean sites, where you don't see uh, colored dots, uh, like um, out here in the Indian Ocean, um, bottom Atlantic, only one dot there in the North Atlantic, um, and out here in the Pacific. Now, there's a reason for that. Of course, um, th these large areas, mainly the open ocean sites, where that you don't see these colored dots, it's because no one has looked for them there. Uh, and also you have to consider that research cruises far, are very far, don't often go far away from a coast. Uh, it, it's very expensive to take a research cruise out so far out, it takes time. And thus um, research cruises out to the, to, the, to the very large expanses of the ocean are rare. So, but if we were to sample these, these open ocean sites, we would definitely be finding oil degraders there. Now, in recent years, some novel obligate oil degrading bacteria have been discovered um, that I haven't presented in the previous slide showing that phylogenetic tree. And these new ones have been found living associated with marine microalgae or phytoplankton. If, if you know what phytoplankton, phytoplankton are like the plants or the rainforests of the oceans. They're the ones that produce about, well, in the oceans, about 50% of the, of the oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, so, this, these discoveries has expanded our knowledge on the diversity of these types of bacteria in the oceans. And we wonder how many more are left yet to be discovered. So it's probably 
quite likely, I would imagine, many new species of obligate oil degrading bacteria still are waiting to be discovered in the oceans. Now, to exemplify the importance of oil degrading bacteria when all spills occur at sea, I thought, what better example than to show this with the historic Deepwater Horizon spill? Now, this spill made headlines all over the world, and it became the focus of many research groups in many countries, not just in the USA, where it all happened. It had to be a big one if a movie was made about it, which it was. It starred Mark Wahlberg and Kate Hudson. Now, someone that I met with over 30 years' experience in working on oil rigs in several countries said to me that the film was a pretty accurate description of the oil rig blowout, including how Mark Wahlberg and other actors portrayed the, the character of workers on, on an oil rig. But the movie was nothing to do with the microbiology, where in the eyes of a microbiologist, the real drama occurred on the sea surface and below, where the oil eventually impacted large expanses of the Gulf of Mexico. So the disaster occurred on April the 20th of 2010, when oil started gushing out from the riser pipe at the seabed here, at the very bottom of the ocean, which was about 1.5 kilometers below the sea surface. And it was capped about three months later on July the 15th of that year. Now estimates vary, but about 4.1 million barrels, which is a bit more than 500,000 tons of oil, entered the Gulf of Mexico over a period of 84 days. That's almost about three months. To try and picture this, that's about 300 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of crude oil. Now that's, that's, that's quite, quite something. The rate of oil gushing into the Gulf varied over the duration of the spill, but on average, this equates to about three and a half Olympic swimming pool volumes every single day. Now, as depicted on this slide, the spill resulted in the unprecedented formation of an enormous oil plume right here. Uh, at a depth of around 1,000 to 1,300 meters below the sea surface, the plume stretched about 30 kilometers on a horizontal axis, a few kilometers in the other horizontal direction, and about 300 meters thick vertically. Now, like, like a cloud in the sky, this massive oil plume that was suspended in the water column almost also moved gradually in a southwesterly direction in the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of the oil that gushed out from the leaky well had also reached the sea surface to form large expanses of oil slicks that could be seen from space. And what was also unprecedented about this spill was the large quantities of chemical dispersants that were used to treat the spill, both at depth here where the, where the oil was gushing out at 1.5 K below the sea surface and also on the sea surface by spraying, for example, from, from airplanes. But the main arsenal to combat an oil spill comes naturally in the form of those oil degrading bacteria, which responded, which we found responded strongly in both the plume and sea, and sea surface oil slicks. Now, bacteria and other types of microorganisms are excellent indicators for the status on the health of local ecosystems, as well as indicators to perturbations in an environment. They are like taking your temperature, if you like, um, to assess whether you might have a COVID-19 symptom. Now, this slide shows a depiction of the water column in the Gulf of Mexico, where the deep water horizon spill occurred. Here, showing the oil gushing out from the leaky well head at the bottom here, and the formation of an oil plume at depth right here. Now, and as you can see, oil also rising up to form uh, these oil slicks at the very top and the sea surface. The scientists analyzing the microbial communities showed that there was a strong response by oil degrading bacteria in the oil plume compared to above and below it. So there was a very strong response in this section here compared to above and below that plume. Uh, and we, and scientists have shown that there was an enrichment um, in a particular taxonomic order of bacteria called the Oceana spirulalis within that plume. And it accounted for about 90% of the total bacteria in the plume region. And it has been shown by sequencing uh, the genome of those types of organisms that they had the capability of breaking down oil hydrocarbons. So they were, they were strongly enriched and we now we know that they were involved predominantly in breaking down the oil hydrocarbons within that plume region. Similarly, oil degrading bacteria on sea surface oil slicks up here 
uh, were also strongly selected for, in particular species belonging to Circulaclasticus, which is a, an organism that's very good at breaking down some of the most toxic hydrocarbons in oil, which are called the aromatic hydrocarbons, especially the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Other organisms on the sea surface that became enriched were called Halomonas, Pseudoalteromonas, and Alteromonas, which are also reg recognized as oil degrading uh, bacteria. Now, work that led to uh, isolating some of these microbes um, that became enriched by the oil and then analyzing of their metabolic capabilities showed that they were actively involved in degrading the various hydrocarbon components that make up the, the oil that gushed out from that leaky well during this massive spill. Now, so this comes, I'm coming now to the end of my talk. And um, so just, just a recap here. I, um, I, I hope I've, I've, this talk has come across to, to convincing you of the importance of, of a particular type of bacteria in our world. And believe me, the, the, the diversity is enormous. Um, but this type is, is, they're very important, the oil degraders. They keep our, our seas and oceans in check effectively from pollution, um, mainly from, from crude oil. Of course, there are many other types of bacteria in the oceans that are important in, in cleaning up and keeping our oceans in check from other different types of pollutants. But these organisms are essential. They're key in breaking down the oil and is the reason why oil does not accumulate in our oceans. So in summary, there are enormous volumes of oil in the hundreds of thousands of tons that enter the oceans and seas every year. The fact that the oil does not form a black uh, slick on the sea and ocean surface is largely due to the presence of the, and activities of these oil degrading bacteria. These microorganisms perform a fundamental role in the oxidation and mineralization of the hydrocarbons that make up the oil, and they are at the heart of bioremediation processes. Now in the sea, some of the most important organisms doing this job are the so-called obligate oil degraders, as, as I've explained in my talk. And we know quite well how these species, who these species are, and based on new species having been discovered recently, such as some that have been found living associated with microalgae or, uh, or as they can be termed phytoplankton, it seems likely that many more may wait uh, discovery. Large oil spills like the historic Deepwater Horizon disaster are horrible incidents, but represent an excellent example of the importance of oil degrading bacteria cleaning up our oily mess. So I'm just gonna, going to now stop sharing my screen because this has come to the end of my talk. And um, right, there's me. I, I hope you've, you've enjoyed this talk. Um, I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Just just thread them through um, the program organizers, and um, I also thank the hosts for organizing this this wonderful program on uh, microorganisms uh, day. And um, I thank you all. Keep well and keep safe. Bye bye.